Hi, welcome to another episode of Complex Like Wine, the podcast where we talk about complicated things and improve over time just like wine does. This week I have Sophie with us and she's going to talk to us a little bit about resiliency and sharing her story. But before that, of course, we have to talk about the wine and taste it. So this week I have a rosé from Tuscany in Italy by the winery called Biero Fosco. And so I think you have a red, Sophie? I do. I picked up, um, well, it's my favorite Chateau St. Michel, which I'm sure you've heard of, but I've never had their Merlot before. I usually don't like Merlot. So I was like, if anything, I'll try it from them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, cheers. Cheers. I hope I like it though. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like the Merlot? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? <laughs> it's not my favorite rosé. I think, yeah, I think I with rosés, I like more s- when they're sweeter. And this one isn't very sweet. Kind of is more dry, I think. But I think if you're into kind of the drier white wines, this rosé would be good for you. But... Yeah. Not on my top, but it's still not bad. Wine is wine. I'll still drink it. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I, I can't be picky because it does taste good. I just, I've never, Merlots are hard for me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, Cabernets are like not my favorite. So I would rather have something else in the cab. But what what type of wine do you usually like more? I love cabernets but also i think you know i like everything but merlots or <laughs> no more i think mm-hmm. i've never had an, yeah or My. you know Zinfandels i'm getting used to more oh, okay i don't really drink a lot of red i usually do more white so i'm really trying to try some more red mm, okay yeah zinfandels i think are my favorite out of all wines so give me some to try because I'm probably just trying the wrong ones. And- oh, okay. No, I'll definitely recommend you some. There's some good ones I've had, so I'll definitely have to send you some that I would recommend. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> but yeah, so for all the viewers out there, Sophie's actually tuning in all the way from Utah. So there's some pretty mountains I'm seeing in her background, which I'm pretty jealous of. <laughs> It's, I know. I, can I like lift it up? Oh yeah, please. If you're on YouTube, watch it. <laughs> yeah, seriously though, this is why I never left. I actually, I think I, I don't know if you know this. I came out in March of 2020. I was volunteering in a hospital at the time and just interning around New York City and working part time and volunteering and um, everything from like volunteering in kitchens to the hospital, everything shut down that weekend from being in community college, everything was shut down and moved online. And um, I just, I had three days worth of clothes and I just came out here and I didn't leave. (laughs) (laughs) Do that. Oh my God. Right? Yeah. If you're on YouTube, I think you could agree with me that all these trees and mountains just so pretty. It's so pretty. It's like pretty high altitude, like doing laundry with the stairs is pretty tough. Oh, I can (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's okay you're getting good exercise on the daily yeah that's true <laughs> but yeah I'll let you share your story yeah no for sure I think um even to just like redirect to because I feel like what's interesting with resiliency is is like you think you almost like learned your lesson at one point and it's like this lesson that you want to preach and teach and then something else hits you (laughs) and you're like, I thought I learned in a building on what I learned. And then it's almost like you're in a puzzle where you're learning like 10 different things at once and they don't fit together. And through your lifespan, maybe the puzzle doesn't come together, but um, I think it's what's really cool about resiliency is it's, you know, one word, but there's so many different experiences and lessons that, I mean, I feel like you can have a podcast just (laughs) on resiliency. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I definitely would like love to hear too, just like your experience through the pandemic, the resiliency after. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yeah, so um, I mean, just really, I came from Long Island, New York, and what I started out with was just pretty much your cookie cutter, like great family, everything. And you know, by 12 years old, my mom was sick. And our whole family dynamic changed. And so all of a sudden it was in this environment where you don't really have a broken home. And I was 12 years old and here my home is broken because no longer can my mom get us up ready for breakfast. And all of a sudden my dad is filling two roles. And it was just like from the get go, like 12 years old, it was kind of like, okay, like this is going to be an atypical path. And Um, I think what was really interesting was being able to kind of witness how my mom approached getting sick and how she kind of was just like, you know, do your worst, I'll do mine. And I think the coolest thing was, you know, at 12 years old, I'm watching someone who was always healthy, just all of a sudden be stuck in bed for like the next four years Mm -hmm. and seeing her use nutrition as not only inspiration, but a way for her to heal and to get better and to get out of bed. It was new because I think most people would be willing to do any experimental drug trial, right? Mm -hmm. Anything. And for her, it was, I don't want to be a lab rat. I want to figure out, you know, what is needed for myself specifically and how I could integrate nutrition. So all of a sudden it was like, okay, that's so cool. Like I'm having these crazy superfood smoothies and this is like early two thousands, you know, like no one knows what, any type of superfood is, I feel like. And um, I have like seeds of weird plants stuck in my teeth that people don't even understand what I'm eating. Um, But it was cool because basically at 15 years old, I was recruited into a ski academy. And um, right off the bat, it was like such a test where um, I was slower than everyone. I could barely ski. I was like the joke where, um, if someone had a bad day skiing, it was like, Oh, you know, I ski like Sophie today. Mm. So it was really interesting because, um, you know, now 15, I have a pretty broken family at home and I lost my grandma. And then two days later, my grandpa passed away. So it was just like everything that could be coming up was all of a sudden coming up. And, my parents ended up splitting at the end of that month because, you know, you lose one parent and then the other one has to cope with the loss of their parents. So it's very hard. So it was just like, okay, like two grandparents lost. My parents are now going to get divorced and I'm the butt of the joke on the ski team. And I'm living out in now Utah, which is um, not only a long way from home, but there's a time difference. So if I really am having any type of panic attack, you couldn't really talk to anyone. And so it was like a very interesting start to my junior year of high school where um, I was so proud to be part of the ski team. Um, I dreamt of ski racing my whole life and to be given this opportunity was incredible, but to be met with um, just so much solitude and um, stress, like at such an early age, was just crazy because it was like, if I wake up and I can just sprint 150%, like I can get through my day. And I really thought forever that that was like the approach to life was you can sprint at 150% and you're doing the right thing. You're making everyone proud and you're succeeding. And so for me, it was like, everyone's making fun of me at skiing. I'm going to work twice as hard our knowledge with nutrition to almost help her get better and to heal and seeing it work for her was inspiring. And, you know, for me, it was, I'm going to figure out how to tie my nutrients and read all of these, you know, different like scientific literature on nutrient timing. And I'm 15 trying to figure out, you know, the right time, the right amount to not only build muscle, but to recover from training. And that way I can just keep pushing the bar. And so I, fell into this really interesting path, I would say, from like 15 years old until um, two years ago, where Mm -hmm. I really thought I was resilient and successful because I was not only achieving what I wanted to achieve, but I thought it was the way in which I was getting there was what made me successful. And so um, I think that really like my hope with 
all of this and this thought of like, what is it to be resilient? I think it's understanding like for yourself individually, like what is synonymous to resiliency? Because for me, up until that point, I thought that resilience was being success, was achieving anything that I wanted to if I'm trying my very hardest, which is just working harder than anyone. You know, you're up when people are sleeping. That whole mantra and mind, everything, I couldn't disagree with more now. And I look at it as like resiliency is all about consistency. It's just about showing up. It's about listening, learning, absorbing your learning environment. And that's it. It's not about this 150% race. Um, And I know it sounds super boring. I think it's supposed to be something like more edgy that you've like figured out. But um, honestly, like after a roller coaster of, I'd say like teenager into adulthood, it really wasn't until I was like flying headfirst into a forest at like 65 miles an hour, 63, but I had one of those like speed apps on. Mm-hmm. It was silly, but um, I was flying headfirst into like a forest of trees and it's so funny. It's, you know, one of those come to Jesus moments where you're, everything's slowing down and you're just kind of like, you finally did it. Um, and I was just on the heels of spending almost a year recovering from a traumatic brain injury that I had suffered while skiing. And it at the time had led to this temporary short-term memory loss. And it took a really long time to figure out, again, using nutrition as a way to help make it more efficient, my recovery. I think that we all know, uh, you know, if you hit your head, probably shouldn't be drinking that much alcohol. (laughs) Well, still trying to get your memory back, but it was cool to discover like other types of antioxidants and ways in which I could just heal and feel like myself again. Um, and it took like a year to just feel normal and to be okay with not being where I was before. Um, and so I, again, thinking about resiliency, I, you know, felt on top of the world because I had come back from, you know, short-term memory loss. (laughs) I could Mm -hmm. remember the room that I came from and what I was doing and, um, just, everything from being more successful at work and being back on track to being able to hold a conversation with friends and um, just not feeling like I was holding everyone up. And so I started to get the anxiety to just lessen and be comfortable that, you know, this is going to be good. It'll be here to stay. My memory is back. And um, so crazy because um, I, I just thought that was it. I thought, you know, there's no escaping death you can't anticipate it. It's here. And I just relax. And it, you know, it was something where I somehow landed and there was broken trees everywhere. I, my clothes were shredded my face was bloodied and, um, I landed and I couldn't feel like half of my body. And I was just so confused. I didn't know if I was paralyzed. I didn't know if I was dying. I just didn't know how I didn't hit my head into one of those trees. I just had ragged all through them. And um, I basically just remember like reaching into my phone and just calling my boyfriend at the time and saying, Hey, you know, I need help. This is bad. Um, We need to go fast. And, um, you know, flash forward, it was going to be this process where, I'd need to learn how to walk again. Um, I had a broken scapula. And so it was one thing to like not have access to the left side of your body. It was another thing to know that you're going to be sleeping, like sitting upright and letting someone else completely just handle you. Mm -hmm. Having been pretty much on my own, like living across the country since 15 to now be, you know, like 26, 25, well, 25 years old at the time and not even be able to leave bed. Um, let alone have everyone do everything for me. It was like a very tough thing to cope because I never felt less resilient. I never felt less successful. I never felt um, like more of a dead weight than when I realized I would just sit in this bed and have someone wait on their hands and knees for me. All of a sudden, this one accident that I couldn't control, a guy on my skis, you know, like I'm on my skis, he's on his skis, he's coming towards me. And next thing you know, I can't avoid the inevitable, which is we're going to collide. 
And it's so bizarre because I couldn't control that situation. And yet here I am wanting to control the level of help, you know, learning how to Mm -hmm. ask for help, but also not feeling guilty that everybody around me is crying, is worried. And it's very difficult to be the cause of someone else's pain. Um, And it kind of doesn't matter how much pain you're feeling because all of a sudden you're also feeling their pain and just wishing that you weren't a burden. Um, And so it's just interesting because all of a sudden, you know, I know that, you know, I'm lucky because not only am I going to learn how to walk, but that means that I'm not paralyzed. It means that I'm actually going to be able to curl my toes, to understand a foot movement, all of these things that we never had to even think about, but let alone, I was so grateful for that opportunity to recover. And all I could think about was how quickly I needed to do this so that I could get back to my life, so that I didn't feel guilty for people helping me, um, so that, you know, I could just get into the shower myself, let alone have to like be showered in bed. Um, And so, yeah, so it was just interesting because all of the stress that I was caught up with, I at the time was working um, for a Wall Street firm. um, So I was pretty much exposed to finance since 2014. And here we are, it's 2019. And um, everything that was so important to me about my life and the life that I was building in finance. And it was just so funny because I even missed being on a New York City subway going to work. And, you know, for so long, I hated everything about just the most trivial things that everyone would be graded for, like walking into the subway, waiting 45 minutes to get onto a subway. The fact that I couldn't even see the subway for months. It was just crazy to all of a sudden be grateful and miss things that I hated and then realize that everything that I was working for didn't even matter because all of the work, all of the connections I made in finance, all of that was on ice. Having someone else fill my spot while I'm on sick leave and just knowing that everything that I worked for could be replaced by another person. You know, the competitive advantage that you're building, you are building, you offer a value add and the burden you put onto someone else having to not only pick up and learn what you're doing, but also realize that that's possible. It made me just look at everything that I was sacrificing and doing and working for just very differently because it was so transient. Um, And so all that I thought about was just thinking how every one of my therapists were themselves 24 seven, they woke up, they got to work, they did not change their personality. And I really realized that this whole injury, everything that I was doing, it felt like a second birthday where I was giving another chance to recover, which was bizarre because I thought that I already had my chance. Like how many more lives do you get to mess up? And I felt that my head injury, I messed up and going into the trees, that was it. And to have a chance to not only take a break from this crazy lifestyle I was living, you know, I'd be up at 4.30, I'd get home at 12. It was just not sustainable. And to all of a sudden sleep in and to be able to be just alone in a bedroom for three months, everything started shifting into realizing that I really connected with being able to just stay myself and not put on, you know, a whole new persona just to be the tough um, woman that is almost expected Mm -hmm. in that world. And though it's possible to put on that persona, if it's not genuinely yourself, that should be a red flag that you're doing something wrong, right? You should be able to just wake up and go to sleep and not shift. Um, and seeing how my therapists weren't shifting, they were just genuinely themselves. It realized it was a huge realization that, you know what, maybe helping people therapy, being in this compassionate and empathetic situation um, really matched what my personality is. And I started to just kind of think about how in this race to get better and to get back to my life, I kept turning to nutrition. Um, And yeah, I don't know. I just think 
being able to recognize that these people that were helping me feel better, I resonated with on a really more like passionate level and was realizing that I was supplementing what they were telling me by looking into my own types of science that it was this whole awakening of if I'm going to have a second birthday and I'm going to have a chance to figure out what it is to wake up and go to sleep and not have to change and be somebody else, but own who I am and be genuinely um, the person that I'm proud of. It was cool because I kind of realized, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm going to erase my resume. It doesn't matter that I already had a degree for finance um, that I've been working in this industry for the last, what, five years it's okay if I have to go back to school. It's find out that if I want to be a nutritionist, if I want to become a registered dietitian and actually be able to medically prescribe and treat people to feel better through nutrition, through what I was passionate about, it would be a long road. I would have to go back to school. I'd have to be not only going through school, but going through an internship for a year that will only put you to an exam. And the odds of getting into school, of passing the exam, of getting a job, um, it, it was just something that seemed like a really steep hill, but in New York, it seemed possible because there are so many job opportunities in such a concentrated area mm -hmm. to me, knowing that I wanted to live in Utah, knowing that I wanted to be out here, that I loved my time here in high school. I didn't think that it would be that easy. I, you know, this is a 300 person town up here. It's, it's not the easiest path, but um, I will say that, you know, resiliency was not me making any one of these realizations and just trying it out. I think that resiliency was just understanding that for me, that will make me feel like I'm successful. It was not about the money. It was not about feeling guilty for having a resume and a career built in an industry already and saying to myself that none of these connections, nothing will help me on my next step into a completely different field. And um, just taking time to realize that everything that I thought I was, I thought that I was driven, but I really didn't have a destination. I, I wasn't passionate about the field I was in. Um, and realizing that I have a destination now, I felt driven. I felt so motivated to get there. I've always found that consistency can feel like such an effort when you lack motivation. But the second you really know what it is that you want to work for, it's kind of hard to fit in anything else because you're just so excited. And, um, you know, it's been almost two years since I have made this decision to jump into something new and every single day I wake up and it's just no matter how tough of a season your own personal life is it's something that lifts you up and really pushes you forward is knowing that you have a destination and however you get there you'll feel successful because you powered through it right and so mm -hmm. for me I always thought a lot of money in a high paying job would make me successful and that that's what I was, you know, primed to do having spent a lot of time, energy and money learning what, what it means to be in that industry, what it means to be successful building and networking. Um, and, you know, having switched and done a 180 and um, in classes with people younger than me, um, taking entry level courses just so I could apply to grad school, it was humbling because you see the anxiety that you also had at that age. And it's so funny because you have so much time. And here I am, older than everyone, in the same spot. You know, we're all in the same room with the same schedule. And the difference is, is that I'm accepting the timeline and the anxiety over the unknown that the classmates share is going to exist until they experience something to challenge that. Um, and I think that that right there is like that moment of resilience where you realize that it's not about the money. It's not about 
what people think or judge or determine as successful. What's going to make you successful is staying driven to whatever it is and just staying consistent. And I mean, I, I can monologue about this forever, mm -hmm. but you know, it's just something where I really think that people are fearful of having time. People just want to sprint at 150%, but it's not sustainable. And making time gives you opportunity to learn and to absorb your environment. And if you want to learn, you can learn from anything. And to think that going from finance to healthcare is makes no sense. It makes a ton of sense. And there's a lot of transferable skills and problem solving and ways in which you can critically think um, and engage your peers that translate. And that's with anything like you could go outside and learn something from your mailman. Like you can learn something from any stranger if you're just willing to actually take a second in your day. And that you can't do that if you're sprinting at 150%. You're closed off. You're focused, you're closed off, and you may think you're driven, but what is that destination? right? You, you really will be redirected and refocused the more absorbent you are around you. It gives you ideas. Um, and I mean, as a filmmaker, I'm sure you know all about this because you really probably can envision it. Yeah, no, like as you're saying now, you being a bit older and now seeing these people like in my age who have all this time and don't know the future and like all these questionable variables. And like for me personally, currently, with this pandemic, you know, I graduated 2020 with a film degree, which is already not a guaranteed narrow, it's a narrow road. And so there's all that additional stress and anxiety of, okay, what am I going to do with this degree? And what am I going to do to support myself? But on top of that, graduating in the pandemic makes it even more scary and more doubtful because as for everybody, there's opportunities that had to be closed. Internships were no longer offered. Schools are no longer accepting people or different things. And so for me, like right now I'm trying to grapple. I've had this year and, you know, I'm very blessed. I'm in a position where I can be at home with my dad in a space where I can be comfortable in the sense of I'm not going to get kicked out. I don't have to pay these really large bills. My dad's very gracious to support me, which I know not everyone has that opportunity, but I'm here with this time of, okay, what do I do? I want to get things figured out. I want to start adulting because the right. waiting, yeah, especially like for me, when I'm not doing anything, I get really stressed and anxious, which ends up making me depressed and then I get stuck and then it's this vicious cycle of I'm already depressed and stuck, but I'm getting more depressed and stuck because I'm stuck and how do I get out of it? <laughs> And yeah. that, yeah, it's, that has been me this past year of like, I don't know what to do. I look at online and there's certain things that like geography, I'm not close enough, or I don't have the certain qualifications to meet this job listing. And I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying about we want to like race and go a hundred miles per hour, but like you said, it's not feasible and there's blessing of being, which I'm learning right now of just being able to take a breather, just sit, yeah. reflect, grow, realize. we are lucky to have that breather, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, like right now I'm just with the whole resiliency is despite my family history and despite everything I've gone through, I was able to graduate. And now I have this time to really focus on me and figure out what I want to do because it makes me happy and fulfills me, not because of the paycheck or because it's easy. It's an easier route. And so yeah. either yeah, either way, if you're picking a job because it's convenient for you or you're picking a job because you love it and it's really difficult, there's going to be pros and cons. And I think just f navigating what at the end of the day is most important to you? What are you going to get fulfillment out of? And where do you see yourself the long term being the most happiest? That takes resiliency into accepting, I think. <laughs> yeah. And that's why it's like this puzzle that, you know, you could have picked up a piece of resiliency and it just doesn't even 
serve you for, you know, whatever season you're facing right now, but it's still in your toolkit, right? Like you're, there's this, it's so weird. There's this Chinese proverb that says, you know, leap and the net will form. And it's the idea it's, you may not even be aware of how some past experience gave you the tool that you needed in this very moment. And that's okay that you're not aware because if you trust yourself and you take that leap, the net forms and you can take a step forward. But with you, you know, it's funny because when I hear about how you so lucky you are to not only have a space to discover and explore and exercise your passions, but when you think about people who think they know what they want and they're one track mind and they're sprinting 150%, and how that can be disadvantages is you're not giving yourself the time to breathe and to explore and to learn. And for those who aren't even as fortunate to have the space to grow because they do have part-time jobs, they have several jobs, they have kids, they have bills, they have debt, whatever that can be. The point is, is that yes, those are very difficult things and the end of the day that is taking them away from this one track 150 percent focused mindset because they have other responsibilities they have to look at their day and if you were to cut it up into a pie of the percent spent doing something no one not you not me not anyone could say that they're spending that entire pie on one task mm -hmm. that would be very disadvantageous to be able to take your kids to school to be able to go volunteer to be able to stay home and wait for a delivery or to go from three different jobs within the same day and miss out on sleep. There's seasons where you're grinding. There's seasons where you can sleep in. It's never going to be a black and white routine. It's going to be a lot of gray area, but no matter what it is, you're not cutting up your pie into a 100% all in on one thing. That entire environment as difficult, as dark as it may seem, you can learn something. Mm -hmm. And it's so cool to not only have that creative space and the free time, but that also can be the devil to have the free time to reflect and to question, right? And the second you start getting in your head, you could just step outside, go for a walk and just start people watching. And be curious, be question if something doesn't even make sense, you know, figure it out by maybe asking the questions or I'll just pour myself some wine in the meantime. <laughs> Perfect. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's no. It's so bad. It's okay. I think I think this looks better. Okay, good. Cool. Hopefully <laughs> like I don't even know where I cut out, but I wasn't kicked out of the meeting and then you texted me saying like, I hope you can rejoin, but you're still there. Well, that's interesting. Like, you disappeared, like, out. So I was like, let me message you really quickly. <laughs> that's weird. Like, oh, I'm frozen. I don't know when I froze because I was rambling, but. Yeah, it's okay. The nice thing about podcasts, especially this one, it's all very candid. So people know we accidentally cut out, but we're rejoining back to kind of where we left off. The last, about the last thing I remember was you talking like, like where we left off was talking about the resiliency and being in this space where you can take a breather and not going a thousand miles per hour. Yeah. Well, so, with, just, you were saying with the pandemic and where you're at and not only having the luxury to take a breather, but recognizing that having the luxury to take a breather, it comes like a lot of stress too. And like, I get that because, you know, from March of 2019 to March of 2020, I was out, right? Like it was very much a gradual process towards adding stuff, right? Because you learn how to walk. And then by March of 2020, it's like, okay, you're now cleared to do crab walks or like lunges, right? So um, physically, right, it's a process, but also mentally it's a process and it can be very difficult when you're like in this nice cushy time period of not being able to do what you find yourself driven to do, knowing what you want to do and not being able to start it is so tough. Mm -hmm. And then being told, wait a second, you have to have all of these requirements before you can even start it. 
and that's what you were saying with film school. And, you know, to become a dietitian, you had to do, I think, nine prereqs of sciences, like a post back before you can apply to a graduate program. And the chances of getting into the graduate program are so slim that they say to expect to get in on your second try. Um, that means that after two years of a post back, you are going to wait another year um, to reapply and hope that it works out. And I know so many people that have applied three times and mm -hmm. some programs after that application process and getting accepted, you then have to apply to a dietetic internship. Not every program gives you that residency, which means the national like, match rate was something like 45%. So after X amount of years of trying and trying to then roll the dice again, um, because you believe in something and you're passionate about it. Now, all of a sudden, as someone who's saying at 25, I'm going to change my career, is fully understanding that all that I can do is try because it could be five years before I even finish a program, start a program. Does not mean I'm going to pass the dietitian exam. So everything from imposter bias to too much free time to think about these questions um, to seeing people reach milestones and feeling very hard on yourself to not even know what that milestone feels like. So, you know, it's interesting when you have time, but I like totally empathize with how much of a mind game it can become because you really don't know. But yeah you have so much time and I think it's so cool when, you know, you're in a class and you can see someone that's going to school and they're in their forties, right? They're in their fifties. It's never too late to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think something really cool about getting after it now is the fact that you know what it is that you want and you're brave enough and courageous enough to go all in. Because when you know that a timeline is as uncertain as where you are and where a career change can be, it's so scary with the uncertainty to go for it. Yeah. It really is. Most people won't. No, you bring up a good point. Like, especially with school, it's never too late to graduate, to learn, to go back to school. Mm -hmm. You know, I think... So at least something that I've noticed with peers or people have told me is some people never get to a point where they figure out what they want to do or right. never get to a point where they have that click in their brain of, okay, this is what I'm passionate about and they get the chance to go back. So it doesn't matter in retrospect, if you graduated a little later than all your peers or it in the long term, who cares? Like as long as you're on your own timeline and if you realize later on, like, you know, actually, this doesn't work for me. Let me do something else. Like, there's much kudos to you because, again, when we talked about so much resiliency to be able to understand, to accept, and to make an action towards a career change. Yeah. And, you know, you have to respect the process. It's something that, yeah, you know, I monologued for probably an hour already about, you know, how I came into wanting to become a registered dietitian and, um, you know, the roller coaster of, um, I think, an experience it was leading me up to realizing that that is something that ignites me is to be able to help people as a living and accept that even if that salary is less than my starting salary out of college, it doesn't matter. That's a nominal thing and your budget will adjust to what you're bringing in and you figure it out. And as much of a monologue as it was about how I figured it out, I'm so stoked I figured it out. But at the same time, you're right. Like most people, and you know, maybe most people listening even don't know what ignites them yet, but it could take 10, 20, 30, your whole life. And it, I think it's a function of your curiosity and your willingness to step outside of what's comfortable um, and to just start charging. I think the fact that you today are saying, I know what ignites me and you're still committing to charging after it is huge, but 
even if you don't know, you still have to charge after it and commit to just learning, um, approaching everything as an opportunity, a way to mm-hmm. grow, enrich yourself, right? And if you look at relationships, right? Like no two relationships are formed and built identically. And it's the same thing with figuring your career out, right? Like there's more than one way to find your calling and it makes a difference to do what you love. And, you know, there's truth to it. There's frustration felt when you haven't found it yet, but just discovering it is something that's going to actually take effort. It will never fall into your lap. It takes a lot of reflection, a lot of reflecting. And I think, you know, it's a hindsight 2020 vision hearing someone's story about how they fell into something, but that story is crafted from reflection, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it takes a lot of thinking to be able to tie a narrative and realize that this is something that is really meaningful. And I think even when you already know, say like you, you know, you know what it is that you want, tying a narrative of how you're going to make it happen is just as important. And a lot of time it's in hindsight, you know, it's often when we fail, we revisit and come back to the table and look at, you know, what we did, what was that narrative, what went wrong. And so that's why, you know, it's always the saying of how it's not linear to success. Mm -hmm. It's, It's always backwards and circles and ups and downs and failure because failure makes you sharpen and refine and pivot. So I think that comparing yourself to, you know, milestones of where people are in their life because they're the same age as you or something. Um, You have to realize that no relationship is formed the same way, no path is formed the same way, and it's going to be your own time. And I think it's really cool that you're giving yourself that time, right? No, yeah. And I I know not everyone ever gets that time. It's like I'm very gracious for it and I now I'm trying to work through getting past the funk or getting stuck creatively and trying to figure out okay what are new things I want to do like hindsight undergrad I never thought I'd make this podcast about mental health and never realized I'd be really dispassionate about it and now I see myself having little ideas and light bulbs of maybe my career path isn't going to be just so linear and there might be other things I can do to intertwine right But, you know, I think this is natural for everyone. Having a lot of decision points brings a lot of uncertainty and pressure and is overwhelming. Like, you know, right, it's such a great time to have time to think through things. But at the same time, you feel pressured that you aren't figuring it out. Yeah. If I didn't have the time then I'd have no chance. And that's not true, right? Because yeah. creativity, again, it's abstract. It just kind of comes and ebbs and flows. There's times when you're going to be more productive writing, more productive cooking, more productive doing anything you want to do and understanding that, yes, you have a lot of opportunities. You're, everyone always says your world's your oyster. And sometimes that's met with more discomfort because it's just like, I don't know, right? I'm mm-hmm. overwhelmed. I, I don't know what that means. And um I think like I would just challenge you every day to engage yourself and say, you know, did you show up for something that you plan to do? Right. And did you ask questions and did you engage with someone that you didn't want to um, or someone that you were intimidated by? Or just did you say, I stepped out of my comfort zone today? And if you didn't, that's okay. But try next week, try tomorrow, you know, right? Like it's a, tiniest of consciousness in terms of shifts that you can do that can make you feel more productive in having so much time. Mm-hmm. I, I was stuck in bed for months and um, I couldn't work towards anything. I, you know, since 15 had been really aggressively working out um, even to keep up working out while being at my desk at six fifteen in the morning at the office. I'd wake up at 4.30 and start getting a workout in before it was formal business tie, right? And so it's something where you just hit with almost a train and you're like, I worked so hard for just something as little as like a physical strength. And now I'm sitting here for months and all of that is 
going to atrophy and go away. And um, it's happening at the same time as all these other things kind of feel like they're drifting away and mm-hmm. you know, you almost feel helpless. And so it's just funny because it's like you can never pressure yourself with feeling like you're not recognizing the gratitude that you are aware, right? There's a difference between awareness and recognition because you could be aware that you're grateful for something, but if you can't even recognize it and you can say you're grateful, but you really can't internalize and recognize that this is grateful, it's because you're putting more pressure on the rate of productivity, right? You're putting pressure on these extrinsic and really relative markers that are crafted by anyone but you. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that, you know, you have opportunity in everything and that you decided to take opportunity and be brave enough to start this path, just being on it's enough, right? Yeah. Just taking a shot is enough and swinging, you know, and swinging at anything and everything. And that's awesome. You know, it, it, a lot of people have too much of an ego to face rejection many times, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I think parents don't prepare us for. I think, yeah, like, I think parents are very good at protecting you, but then you don't get the experience of how to take rejection. And rejection doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means that this isn't the path for you. Or maybe there's room for you to like learn from that and what can you do to make adjustments to get past it. Rejection is giving you room to grow. And if you think you have too much room, it's like rejection is bringing you back to your drawing board. And um, it's funny because I, so I minored in forensics and criminology. Um, just, I was always fascinated with That's just, badass. Yeah, it was awesome. And USC actually has a great course in it. And it's really focused not only on like what it means to be deviant um, and how does someone become deviant or criminal, but it's all about kind of questioning and revisiting and trying to understand that what you may think doesn't have enough evidence to support what you may think and that you can't just walk in knowing that you have to prove everything wrong before you can come up with a theory. And it's anecdotal in many ways to what we're saying, which is failure, right? That brings you to recognize you got to go back to the drawing board. And that's really, right, how you solve a crime. It's this idea of we need to prove everything wrong and the last thing will be right. Right. Mm-hmm. So fail and to keep failing. Well, we may not know how many theories there are out there. And a lot of times you keep trying to prove and prove and prove and fail and fail and fail. And maybe this one you weren't able to disprove. And so you're going to hold it on ice and try to disprove some other stuff and see what's left over. Right. That could take forever. Yeah. And that's a really rich field. Like a lot of people like to watch those shows. A lot of people work in those fields. And um, that's pretty much rejection every single day. So, it, you know, it's something that you want to learn so that you can help your kids experience it, mm-hmm. not protect them from it. Yeah, there's a difference between like petting your kids or yourself in a bubble and not exposing yourself. And then when you're shown all the different aspects of what being human and what life is, the good and bad, but knowing the proper way how to navigate that. I I wanted to touch on, because you were talking a little bit about like being stuck in like comparison, especially when you're in like your 20s or even before and after when everyone's on a timeline and it seems like you're not matching and having the imposter syndrome. What is advice or tips that you would give to like our peer group people my age even me of like you're stuck with comparing comparing yourself to people that might see more ahead maybe they have a career already maybe they're got married and some people feel like they have to catch up what would be something you'd want it for them to take away from that yeah um a mentor had shared with me about 
I'm going to say three years ago now, um, this idea of this to be list and the to be list um, is something where, you know, anytime you have an inkling of what it is that you want to be right. If you're out there, you're observing everything. You're always up for learning and asking questions. You might have a really long list and that's awesome because the longer your list, the better of a reality check you can give yourself because anytime you start to compare, start to even feel the heat, the physical heat of that anxiety of, oh my gosh, what, like, this is what I should be doing. Why am I not doing that? And I feel heat just wash all over me, that type of anxiety. And you just have that little list of what do I want to be? Um, and it grounds you into remembering that those are things that are not on your list. And if they are on your list and they're at the top of your list or at the bottom of your list and they're there, and you're upset that someone else is achieving it before you, then that's interesting because that's a time to say, well, also on this list, do I want to be grateful, gracious? Do I want to be accepting? You know, whatever those adjectives are that you want to be, I almost can promise that on there is being self-loving and accepting. And the idea is, if you can check yourself and look at that to be list and recognize that that's not even something that you want and you're getting hung up over. Well, now let's even revisit. Why is it that you're upset? Because society, right, is toxic in a way of making you believe those are things that you're supposed to want. Those are things that you're supposed to want to be. Um, yet when you have your own personal list, it's not even there. And if it is there, you want to be married, right? That's great. You want to be married, but you didn't say you wanted to be married by this age. And then is that something that you really want to be or is that something that you feel entitled to? So, you know, I always say you have to qualify what it is that you want to be with, are you entitled to that? And what, why are you, what, what makes you entitled? Because even the most humble rushes into entitlement, right? We all think that we deserve something we don't, you know, you should just be happy to be here because mm -hmm. I am. And I never was until I almost died. And then, um, just thought that I was dying and was paralyzed. And it was just one of these moments where, you know, for me, I'm just happy to be here and I'm just thrilled to share it with people that want to share their day with me and to be here right now with you and um you know hopefully it resonates with others but for them to know that anything that's happening on some periphery that gives you that anxiety revisit with your own desires um keep that list on you keep adding to it make it on your phone wherever um and revisit that and you know try to remind yourself that who you are is unique and if you're putting something on that to-be list that is not something that you want to grow into, but is an expectation that you feel entitled to, then revisit that. Because to be married by age 25, that doesn't mean anything about love, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you want to be loved or you want to be cherished or you want to be respected. Because when you get married, that's, hopefully a byproduct of meeting a best friend that does all of those things. Right. So yeah. you shouldn't expect or feel entitled to marriage because it's so difficult to, in a world of so many people, so focused on so many things to find someone that has the capacity to love and respect a stranger. Right. So for me, I'm always like, I want to be that. I want to be able to love and respect strangers. I want to be kind to anyone around me because that's what everyone wants to receive. Right. And so I hope that's helpful, but <laughs> no, I think that's super helpful. I know I'm not the only one that's listening to you and being like, damn, that's, <laughs> that's so true. Fuck. Like, okay, I'm going to really have to like journal this down and just reflect get my to be list and figure out, okay, what is it that I feel like I have expectations or entitlement and what are things I actually want because right. something I care passionate about. Yeah. Right. Like are your goals things that you feel entitled to? And if you do like start writing down like those things that 
almost promote entitlement and try to strip that away. Because for me, I really felt entitled to so many things until I just kind of took a step back and, you know, having really like felt like I lost everything in that one second. And I remember just praying. Like I never thought of myself as a religious person. And I just sat and was just praying, praying that if I could get off that mountain, that, you know, I would do all of these things and that I would quit my job, that I would not be a pushover, that I would not be a people pleaser, that I would not be all of these things that were such weak adjectives that I honestly, in others' perceptions, they don't see that, but it doesn't mean that that's not how you feel. And um, I just remember, you know, praying and saying that I would do all of these things if I could only just walk. Um, and it took, you know, over a day to hear what a diagnosis was, to hear that I'll be okay, to hear that, you know, I'm going to walk. And um, that night, it was just so funny because it it is so vivid, right? And I think I'm lucky in that I hope to have experienced it so other people don't have to experience a hard truth that they can hear from someone, you know, that's lived it, that really genuinely is all, you know, all emphasis on the fact that like, you have to just understand that you are not entitled to anything and you should just be happy to be here. And if that day means you are unemployed, um, you're broken up with, you're rejected, you're um, coping. I mean, that means that you had appreciated something and valued it. And it's very beautiful to learn what you appreciate and value because if we're all searching for what it is that ignites us, then we feel like we have no direction. We can at least recognize that, wait a second, we feel love, we feel excitement, we feel passion. We're going to be okay because we can recognize that in any rejection and anything negative, that meant that there was something there that we felt and we loved. And that's enough reassurance to know that you can identify, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, wait a second. Things are going to work out. I'll figure it out. I'll find it because I'm capable of seeing this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This life is just so short and so fragile. There's yeah. no point in feeling that you're stuck into doing something just because there's expectations put pressured on you or you feel that you have to be with a certain type of person or a certain type of job or some path just because you feel stuck or obligated to do it. And sometimes it takes an accident. Sometimes it takes listening to this podcast and realizing like, you don't have to feel that way. And right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story and perspective. <laughs> I know for me, there's just so much like listening to you, just reflection I'm going to have to do and something about whether you're in a path where you're grinding, that you have a grinding season or you're in season like me where it's a lot of downtime and reflecting and growing. There's something that just about being humbled and realizing like, what can you do to make the most out of this time, whatever it is. And if it means making a career change path, like it's never too late. As long as the at the end you feel accomplished, you're fulfilled, and you know you're making an impact not only for yourself but for others. I think that's yeah. one of the most important things. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. And I think also in the meantime, if you can go to sleep and you know, close your eyes at night and say, I'm proud of myself for today, great. You know, if you can go to sleep and just be happy with who you are and the values that you share um, and hold on to, then that's awesome. And I so admire and so wish to be like you, who actually is open and vulnerable and acknowledging that these are not only hard times that you're going through, but these are hard times that we've all gone through. And a lot of us aren't brave enough to admit um, the mental health struggles or the self-doubt or any type of skepticism. Um, and so I just adore that you have an episode for anyone to heal to, you know, and it's continuing and we all need that. Mm. I don't know. I like, I'm always wanting to be more vulnerable. Um, and it's been something so difficult and this is such a great medium to not only allow me to be more vulnerable, but, um, to really learn from you. And it's honestly, like I'm 
choking you up because it's so dry up here. I'm not about to cry, but <laughs> <laughs> it's so dry up here. But no, I really do admire um, just, and I hope you see that, you know, this is something that is not just for us here, just for your listeners, but something that is like really anecdotal to like everyone and anyone trying to form a relationship. Um, that vulnerability is so key. Um, and that vulnerable vulnerability is not weakness. Um, Mm -hmm. so I really love that this is a way in which you get to be vulnerable and, um, I really admire that. So. Thank you so much. That was really sweet. Thank you for being vulnerable with me. (laughs) (laughs) I no no bullshit. I've definitely learned a lot from you and there's a lot that I admire about you. And when we talked before, even before today, just talking about there, there's just something about every your energy and your perspective on everything is just very pure and you have so much insight to offer. And so I know I'm not the only one that's going to benefit from listening to this episode. Well, thank you. And I so appreciate it, but I promise like, I wish that, anyone could see themselves through someone else's eyes because um it's so hard to hear and believe when someone is so kind and i so appreciate it and i hope that you know it's something that i can listen to again and believe because it's so hard Mm -hmm. for anyone to really believe but um i just Thank you, because I really appreciate that. (laughs) (laughs) No problem. Yeah, I think it's another layer of vulnerability to be able to listen to someone compliment you and accept it and not let your inner voice try to downplay it or... Right? Yeah. And it's something that, again, it's, you know, no one's perfect or evolved. Like, I would love to be better there. And um, it's funny because your inner voice, right, is always going to be your worst critic. But it mm-hmm. is so sweet to hear that. And that means the world. So thank you. Mm, well, it's true. Yeah, of course. Is there any last thing you wanted to share with listeners? You know, I would just say that listening to your podcast, because with my whole thing about learning and being open and being curious, it doesn't matter where or when, but a podcast is a great way to just go for a walk, to breathe, and to kind of distract yourself from that immediate emotion you're feeling and to just listen to, you know, um, vulnerability is really cool. It's humbling. So keep listening, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a little plug in for myself. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, Cheers again. I had a really great time getting to talk to you more. I finished it. Same. (laughs) Good good timing. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, guys. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I hope you took something out of it and really enjoyed it. It was really great talking to you, Sophie. (laughs) For listening. (laughs) Yeah. So... Thanks, guys. Of course, the link to the wine and Instagram handles will be in the bio, like always. And stay tuned for next week for another episode. All right. Bye, guys.